Chris Stapp's Porzingis, he is listed as questionable for tonight's Game 3 after suffering a torn medial renaculum in his left leg. So here he is just two hours ago. He's walking with no noticeable limp, a black sleeve on that ankle. He gave me the thumbs up on his way out of the arena. I'm not sure what the thumbs up was two or four. I was like, are you playing? Well, we'll see. Well, he was in good spirits, though, and head coach Joe Mazzula, he said any decision on whether Porzingis will play will not be determined by Porzingis himself, but by the team's medical staff in order to remove the decision-making powers from his hands here. You can see, though, his impact is evident when you look on and off the floor, his numbers in the finals so far. The Celtics, they've dominated the Mavs by 25 points in the 44 minutes he was playing through two games, but in the 52 min minutes he's been out, these teams have been a draw. So let's bring in now our senior NBA insider, Adrian Wojnarowski. Woj, what is the Celtics' level of confidence here that we could see Chris Stapps Porzingis in this game three? Uh, Malika, so far the, the Celtics have not ruled out Chris Stapps Porzingis. And if it's up to him, you know, as he said yesterday and I'm told remains today, you know, he's determined to find a way uh, to try and play game three today. I'm told it will not be easy for him to play. It will be even more difficult for him to play well with this injury. It was described to me, you know, this ankle injury that he's going to struggle uh, with uh, that ankle feeling like it's solid and in place. And yeah. it's going to feel loose at times. And that'll be the challenge for Chris Stapps Porzingis, who just came back, you know, for game one of the NBA Finals, obviously had a tremendous game one performance, you know, certainly spurred on uh, Boston. and But yet he remains determined to play in game three, uh, but as Joe Mazzulla said, as the Celtics are saying, you know, this is a serious injury. And cer certainly they're going to monitor him, you know, up until game time. But uh, again, uh, Chris Stapps Porzingis remains determined uh, to go out and play uh, in this game that certainly Boston uh, could give them an opportunity to, to, you know, really put this series away with a win. Yeah. I turn to you because I don't know, hearing it could feel loose is not exactly what, what I would want to be hearing. How much could his injury impact these finals? Well, I know one thing. Wendy got an opinion. You have an opinion. Tanae got an opinion. Richie got an opinion. And I got an opinion. And, that, and then it's the truth. And the truth is, what that graphic showed us before you went to Woj, yep. they're plus 25 with him on the floor, and they're even without him on the floor. He's the most important player in this series, especially when it comes down to the Boston Celtics. He's the reason if they're going to win, if they're going to win this championship and hang banner number 18 offensively. We know what he brings to the table: seven three, being able to space the floor, but also the mismatches, being able to take advantage of those on the post. He has been dominating those, those mismatches coming in off the bench. Defensively, when you have a guy that's 7'3 and athletic and engaged, it allows your perimeter players to do so much defensively. Pressure up on the ball, things to that nature. And he's been doing an outstanding job of his switches, right? Switching out on Kyrie Irving, 7'3. All of a sudden, he used a stick hand. He becomes 11 foot. It's a lot different when you got Al Horford and Chris Tapazingas anchoring that defense. And if he's not close what it sounds like to you know 70 percent then Dallas should be feeling pretty damn good coming into this game tonight being down 0-2. You're right. Chris Saps for Zingas is the most important probably I'm, player I, I in this when series. You started when you say I'm right. Appreciate it. Sorry. I guess you're right on the truth because those numbers don't lie. Chris Saps for Zingas is the most important player in this series yep. because if we learned from the series before, they were winning games. In this NBA Finals, they're blowing out the Dallas Mavericks when he is on the floor because he is the ultimate mismatch. If we take it to the court, I'll tell you exactly how he gets it done. Watch this right here. He is an elite spacer. This is an inversion. Typically, your post player is where Derek White is. No, he's on the outside. Why? Because he forces this tough decision making. You never leave the corner. Why? Look at the catch and shoot numbers. 39% shooter catch and shoot. Now you put the defense in a scramble. It's a tough position. And Drew Holiday, the guy of game two, yeah. is able to thrive because he's just simply on the floor. Again, look at this. He's in the corner once again. Now this allows Jason Tatum, we talked about the blow bys, to blow by a defender. And you can't come off 
off of him. Look at how much space is between Chris Stapps and his defenders because the reality is his ability to shoot, his average three-point distance mm. is 27 feet yep. over the course of the regular season and the postseason. That's third best in the NBA as a seven, what, what is he, seven three? Seven three. Seven three. Yeah. Removing him from the equation, if he's not 100%, yeah. it changes the game because we've seen it. We've seen what they look like before without him playing his best basketball. And, and watching that film just now, give a lot of credit to Joe Mazzulla because while Christoph Porzingis was spacing, he's done an excellent job of putting Derek White and Drew Holiday mm -hmm. in those dunker spots. That's the adjustment he made also, one of the adjustments he made in this series. And why that's so important is what you talk about you eliminate the shot blocking presence. Yeah. If you want to help out, we got a seven foot four dude that's going to shoot your face off. If you try, and again, when you look at all the Luca blows bys, right? right? He normally has a shot blocker there that can help him. If not, now you have a guard there, and that's so much easier mm -hmm. to either pass through or to finish over the top. So again, he is an important, important chess piece, but I truly believe he's done his job. He helped them get two victories. They were nine and one without him. They, I got you at a 2-0 lead. I've had ankle surgery. I know what they, when they say that it feels loose, I know what that means. You don't want to play through it, especially when you're, good. especially it, you can get through it. But if your other leg is hobbled and now you have a seven foot four guy with uh, a history of injury, he's got both of his wheels banged up and we're like, can you give us more? I'm uh, we have 2 0. -oh. How much more do you want me to do? Didn't Wendy say on the show yes. yesterday, which I, I my jaw is still on the floor, that you had the same injury? I had as... tendonitis in that tendon. Okay. Luckily, I didn't get it dislocated. And I'm going to tell you, I had to use powerful painkillers, and it lasted for two months. And to be clear, you weren't playing in the NBA Finals. I was, not, <laughs> I, was, I, was on, I was on the golf team. Thank you very much. Yeah. You know, that number we keep showing is plus 25. It was actually well over 30 before the fourth quarter of game two. Mm. When he got hurt and tweaked, it the, the the Mavericks went on a run. They basically had to call timeout to bench him. So to me, it's not about whether he can play or not. If he does play, how effective can he be? And the cascading effect is what does that mean for Al Horford? Al Horford has been a much more effective player this postseason and regular season when he plays 30 minutes or less. If Porzingis can't go, or if he's very limited and they right. can't keep going, and they got to have Horford go out there for 35-ish minutes, then Horford becomes diminished. So this is a big cascading effect. Mm -hmm. I will say I think it's a good sign that he came to the arena today yeah if they were just having him stay at the hotel I think he was probably testing it out if I was he, told he participated well and, and, and also this maybe he does need some rest let the inflammation all but if you're up 2-0 let's imagine that he doesn't play in these two games and he plays in game five right. so it's not like we got to get game three we got to get him out there on the floor there is window here with the amount of time off but, but also if he chooses to play you're gonna still have to guard him yeah to me he's it, gonna have to guard it, somebody being here and Brian can speak <laughs> to this what? being here in Dallas it was such a strange turn of events though to go from this is Joe Missoula is not very worried about this to to this announcement that it's day to day, to this is a very serious injury, to Chris Epps Porzingis saying that he is optimistic, to <laughs> it being taken out of the medical staff's hand, and now him being at shoot around, and I'm told participating. So we will see what happens for this game three. <laughs> So Kyrie Irving, he's struggled offensively in the final, scoring 14 points per game on 35% shooting while missing all eight of his three-pointers. As a primary defender, meanwhile, he's allowed nearly twice as high of a shooting percentage as he has shot on the offensive end. So here's Kyrie on what he and Luka talked about ahead of game three. Well, it started with me. Um, just telling my hermano, just I got to play better for him alongside him. And, um, you know, in order for us to... Um, you know, accomplish our goal. Uh, we both have to be playing well, and we both have to be doing the little things and doing whatever it takes to win. So, uh, easy conversation, but it started with me reaching out, just letting him know that you know it's my it's my fault, it's taking accountability for not playing particularly well. Um, but also, I gotta continue to trust my guys around us or around me, and um, you know, have fun in the process. Uh, we've gotten this far because we've been a great team, um, not because we've just put it on me and Luca. All right, so the party in Dallas is starting behind us. But, Kurt, I hear you have a pep talk for Kyrie Irving. I do, and you damn right you should address Luca because, look, the finals start June 6th. I hope you get here today. And, look, here's, here's the thing, Kyrie. You're the only leader that got – you're the only person on this team that got a championship, right? You got to lead. You got to show up and show out. You're one of the most skilled players to ever touch the damn basketball. Okay, look, when you and Luca married – Okay, y'all had an agreement. Y'all were going to pay bills together, combined. Damn it, the rent is due. 
but I appreciate the shoes. All right, Richard, so if, if Kyrie is going to heed that call, what do they need to do to get him going tonight? I don't think they need to do anything to get him going. There is no defense that has been created that can really, truly stop Kyrie. There is no, there is no defensive player. Even Drew Holiday, one of the best generational defenders we have seen, has said you got to pray because he can hit left-handed shots from three to win the game. But I will stand by. I would not be up here as an NBA champion if Kyrie had been performing the way he is performing right now. He is key to their championship. He was key to our championship. So, again, Kyrie going on the road, scoring 41 points. That's why I can sit up here and say I'm an NBA champion. And the Dallas Mavericks need the similar type performance from him. Two of his worst games in his finals career have been game one and game two. I think he will respond. Well, this is simple. Their big man is either injured or out. Luka is banged up and injured. Kyrie, now is the time you got to deliver. You got to do it right now. It's very simple. He can't mess around. He's got to be very definitive. He's got to be very decisive. They're, if they're going to bring out Al Horford on him, he's got to attack him. He's got to attack in transition. He's doing too much dribbling, too much indecision. He's got to be, you know, he's in his home arena. No more Boston fans. There's not going to be that here tonight. No reason he shouldn't deliver his best game of the series. And there was no indecision in 2016, Richard, for your squad. I want to take a flashback there because if we're trying to figure out how to get Kyrie going, he played against, he played alongside LeBron James, someone who controls the game so well. Luka does the same thing, but Kyrie, most importantly, still needs the ball in his hands. If we're honoring Jerry West, Kyrie is a dog. He can be a wolf. He can win at the highest level. And if we're able to uh, run the tape here of 2016, you'll see that when he gets the ball early in transition, I can't take you serious because he's twerking to this Texas music. Like, but if we can see the up. tape of 2016, you can see that LeBron was cool with him initiating the offense. Yeah. In, in transition, there's a rebound. Watch, he was aggressive. These highlights show you that he's open when he's open and he's downhill and he has advantages. He can get himself going so that he can feel confident to take the toughest shots and make the toughest shots because they need him now to do that more than ever. The Mavs so far are 6 for 24 on wide open threes in the finals. He has to be the one to knock it down. He's the one who has the experience right. and he needs to take a page from that championship team and realize it's okay if I have the ball even though Luka's in control. Right. The same thing he did with LeBron. Well, because we don't know how in control Luka Doncic is going to be. As Tim McMahon and I reported yesterday, he had to get a shot in his rib cage area ahead of game two, a pain-killing shot, and we expect him to get another one here tonight ahead of game three. This is not an 100% Luka Doncic, but what do they need from him, Richard? Well, I think I think what we saw in game, in game two on the offensive end, right. we need to see that on the defensive end he has to be better Luca you have to understand that because of the way that the Celtics are playing you don't have a shot blocking presence behind you so that means that one two dribble Park says you got to move those puppies better because they got too many guys that can attack Luca he's got to do a better job he's got to recognize what they're doing and how they're attacking him but I think his numbers were great minus the turnovers he got his he got his assist up but he still had eight turnovers he's got to be more efficient with that and he's got to continue to be aggressive. Not to mention his shooting declined over the course of the game after getting off to a strong start, 13 points on 5 of 7 shooting in the first. I also think that Luka has to lean on his teammates more. He has to trust others. Like we saw earlier in the playoffs, he was getting off the ball a little bit more. Now he's probing a little bit longer. Let Allow guys to be the better version of themselves and take some pressure off of you, especially Kyrie Irving. I love when Dante Exum comes in the game. He puts the pace tremendously, but to be honest, with you. We're talking about Kyrie and we're talking about Luka, but Jay Kidd has to help those guys out. And how do you help them out? Stop playing Maxi Cleaver. He hasn't hit a shot in the month of never will. you got to start playing Tim Hardaway Jr. and Hardy. Bring those kids off the bench and provide space. I disagree with you on the fact that Luka trusts his teammates. He does. They just miss shots. I think Jason Kidd has to put him on the back line of the zone, not the front line of the zone, because he's not he's not 100% they blow by, he can have a better defensive stand on the back lane.